Today we gather in community where all are welcome, all here because our lives have been impacted by the life of Donald Michael Muffet. We are all here to love and support each other and to celebrate life together. We meet here today to glorify God and to celebrate the gift of Donald. We want to celebrate how God and family were at the center of Donald's life. I'm Reverend Kathy DeCready, an ordained deacon here in the United Methodist Church in East Ohio. And I grew up with Donald because I was a friend of Molly's from church camp. And the Muffets have become a family to me. And I'm honored to have been asked to lead us through this time of grief and confusion, of healing and of hope, of longing for heaven, and discovering a God who loved Donald before we did, and a God who has received Donald into new life. We will join our voices now as we stand to sing Amazing Grace. Welcome. I'm Pastor Mark Slay, and I'm very blessed to be the pastor of this local congregation and very honored to be involved with Donald's um, service here today. Here are these words of insurance. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? A reading from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning in verse, verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out to us who belong to the, his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace, he has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. The Spirit is God's guarantee that we will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. We did this so we will praise and glorify him. So this day, we bear witness to Donald's life, who now in death blesses us with the spirit in which he lived his life. In the Beatitudes of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus described those of us who are gathered here today. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are we who mourn, for we have been privileged to walk alongside Donald through his life's journey. Blessed are we who mourn, 
for we have been graced with the precious gift of Donald's love and friendship. Blessed are we who mourn, for although Donald's living spirit is gone, we know that the love he shared with all of us will never die, for that love now lives in each of us. May God grant us the grace that in pain we might find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. We come to celebrate the life of Donald. We come to remember his laughter, his love of children, animals, his dedication to family and friends, to testify to his faith and send him home into the presence of God, his creator. If you'll bow, let us pray. O God who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace that as we shrink before this mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live. Help us to live into the knowledge that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Especially we praise you for Donald, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of these gathered here, grant your peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. And if you will, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and lead us not to temptate. Forgive us against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me this morning as we join in reciting the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is is my my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please be seated. Reverend Kathy DeCreedy. Donald Michael Muffet was born on January 19, 1977, in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Donald came to live with the Muffet family on June 6, 1979, where he was claimed and adopted at two and a half years of age by Mom Janet and Dad Mickey. Donald was the baby of the family for a little while, with Molly and Mallory mothering him with love. And Trey came along a year and a half later. They all grew up on the farm, riding horses and nurturing a love for animals. And the brothers sword fighting on the roof. I just learned that story. It was a magical childhood. Donald graduated from Shenandoah High School in 1995, where he wrestled and played football, sang in the chorus, threw shot put and discus, went to dances with girls, and after high school enrolled in the U.S. Army, where he served for two years. Later in life, with 
guidance from his godfather and biggest supporter, Daniel Muffet. Donald earned his CDL license and worked as a truck driver for several companies, including Village Lumber and Supply, the family business. In recent years, he worked as a licensed sales manager at Allstate Insurance. As an adult, Daniel helped the family grow as he reconnected with his four biological sisters, Bonnie, Rachel, Millie, and Teresa, and brother Bill. Donald shared a passion for Huskies with his sister Bonnie and being family together. Donald blessed and grew the family yet again when he married Tina. And with that marriage, a much loved arrived on the scene when Tina's daughter Brianna became part of the family. Brianna's photos and artwork decorate the walls of the family house and she was joined as cousin and granddaughter. Brianna shared in the love with each other, the farm and the horses, and although no longer married, Tina and Brianna and her husband Brad and Xavier are a cherished part of the Muffet family. Donald loved attending church and family gatherings, playing board games, playing billiards with his brother-in-law Kevin, and participating in good and lively discussions and thoughtful discussions. Donald was an amazing uncle to nieces Haley, Kylie, Maya, and Lily, and nephews Eli and Christian. He could always be counted on to bring the fruit tray to the family gathering. And recently, Donald had been attending the Denison First Church of God where he lived in New Philadelphia. The folks at the First Church of God in Denison are praying for you all right now as a gathered community. I spoke with their pastor last evening who regretted that he wouldn't be able to be here, but shared Donald's great faith shared that his last conversation with Donald on January 1st was filled with prayer. He acknowledged that Donald was a talker <laughs> and treated his grandchildren like gold. Donald shared a home with two cats, Snuggles and Yoda. Shortly after Christmas this year, Donald contracted COVID and quickly needed hospital support. After days on a ventilator, Donald Michael Muffet died on January 19th, 2022, 45 years to the day of his birth. Donald was a gentle giant who was loved by many. He is survived by his parents, Mickey and Janet, sisters Mallory, Molly, and brother Trey, and the many of us. Who miss him. But Donald's journey did not end that day. It was changed. Donald began his eternal life in heaven. This is the faith that Donald professed. He is healed and he is claimed by a God who adopted him long ago. I would like to invite Monica Moyer to come and share, and then other family members will be invited to share after that as well. Well, Kathy, I have to say you stole a little bit of my thunder here. Sorry. You took a few of my story. <laughs> so just get ready because you're going to hear them twice. I just say mine with a little more flair. Okay, can you hear me? I don't usually work with microphones. Um, hi. Thank you all for coming. My name is Monica Roland Moyer, and I am Donald's Fuzzin. I know you're probably all wondering, what is a Fuzzin? Well, Fuzzin is the best kind of cousin. It's a fake cousin. It's the kind you choose. I have known Donald and the Muffet family my entire life, and I am honored to talk about Donald today. Donald's start in life, give me one sec, I need to pull myself together. I don't know why I volunteered to do this. Okay. 
Donald's start in life was not necessarily an easy one. He was about two and a half when Janet and Mickey adopted him. They had just lost their son, Jason, and got a call that there was a baby boy that could be adopted. So even though, even through their broken hearts, they opened it up and adopted Donald. He was an easy little boy. Janet would say, time to go to bed. And Donald would say, okay, and go to bed. I don't know about you other parents out there, but this is not what happened in my house. Donald fit into the family, and he loved living on the farm and going swimming in the pond most of all. <clears throat> As a kid, Donald liked to ride horses, or maybe I should say horse around on horses. He was playing in the arena one day with Mallory, and he was messing around on a horse, Bridget, that was an easy, nice horse, and Mallory's like, stop it or you're going to fall off. Well, of course, he didn't listen to her, and of course, he fell off. She went over and yanked him up real quick and was like, Donald, I told you, and Donald's arm was like half and limp hanging there. But Molly, Trey, and Mallory did not really have sympathy for him because they were just mad that now they had to do his chores for him. He was always a tender boy. When he would get mad at his siblings or at his mom or dad, he didn't hit or fight. He would just stand there and blow out his cheeks and blow out his nostrils like a bull. Donald went to Shenandoah High School where he played football and threw shock put. He did some other things too, but the one thing that he did that surprised his nieces and nephews even just this last Christmas was that he sang in the choir. They could not believe he could sing. After high school, as you've learned already, he enlisted in the Army for two years and was honorably discharged. Um, <clears throat> when he came home, he got a CD CDL license and drove a truck, or as truckers say, I'm down with the lingo, drove truck. He was a manager, his latest career was a manager at Allstate. I could go on about Donald's jobs, but I think we can all agree that it was Donald's big heart that stood out the most in his life. When Donald and Tina got married, he adopted our daughter, Brianna. She was 10 years old. And anyone who has, has had, or has ever been around a teenage girl knows that this was quite a feat. He loved her like his own, and he loved his grandson, Xavier. One of my favorite pictures that's back on the board is of Big Donald holding that sweet little boy. Families were very important to Donald. No matter where he was, he would always come back for family get-togethers on the farm. If you look at the pictures on the boards in the back, you can see Donald always standing in the back with a big smile on his face. He reconnected or connected with his biological family as an adult. <clears throat> this was a great joy to him. He really loved their get-togethers and getting to know them as they did him. Donald loved all his nieces and nephews, whether throwing them in the pond, playing cards, or just joking around with them. He really liked to have in-depth conversations with them down by the pond. <clears throat> really, he liked to have in-depth conversations with anyone. <laughs> He would even stay after church so he could talk with his pastor. I think that says a lot. No offense, pastor. But. And in a family of people who also have their own views, he could stand his own. Donald loved animals. He got into raising huskies with his sister, Bonnie. And he had two cats, which you already learned, are Snuggles and Yoda. But those are not the only animals Donald had. Of course, living on a farm, he had horses and goats and I don't know what else, farm animals. I'm from the city. But when Donald came home from the army, he also brought with him this humongously gross um, boa constrictor snake that he had to feed rats, and it, it was not good. 
And I think we could just say, all of us can agree, that he was the only one that loved that thing. I learned this week that awesome, that awesome, that Donald was an awesome card giver. He wouldn't just pick out one, just walk in and see it said sister and pick it up and take it. No, he would read them, like read them and pick one out that he really thought would go with the person that he was getting it for. I'm not talking those 99 cent cards that we all buy. I'm talking the book cards that say things and are good. And he would spend some money on those. My father, Guy Rowland, who passed away four years ago, loved himself some Donald. I remember Donald would show up at the lake, just show up out of nowhere, pull in, lumber up to him, and he and Dad would stand around and laugh and talk and laugh some more. One time we were at the lake, and Donald showed up, and I had been driving my dad's truck, which I don't think I should have been because I got a big dent in it, and, which is not really all that unusual. I can say I might have put a few dents in a few cars in my lifetime. So I was, Dad was mad, of course. He's grousing about, rah, 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 you can't, rah, rah, rah. and Donald looks and says in his laid-back way of talking, <clears throat> well, I could just pop that out. <laughs> and I was like, in my non-laid way back of talking, I was like, no, you can't. And he was like, okay. And he put his hand behind there, popped out the dent. I was like, what? <laughs> and Donald just looked at me and said, I told you I could do it. And that, to me, wraps up Donald. Donald was his own man. He made his own decisions. Although we might not have agreed with them, he lived and died by those decisions. I am not a very religious person. There are a few things I do know. One is that death is easier for the person who has died than it is for the people left behind. Donald is at peace with the life that he lived. It is the people who loved him that are left to wrestle with the grief, guilt, anger, and sadness. The second thing I know is that there is a heaven and that we meet up with the people, the loved ones that have already passed. I can see Donald lumbering in there like he did and seeing the brother that came before him and say, hey, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for the life I had. I could see James and Matthew waiting to hug him. And I could see my dad waiting to hug him and then have a few choice words with him. Thank you all. Thank you, and our prayer is that our time together and the sharing of those stories are steps in that healing and that grief, and even our own coming closer to a faith and a knowledge of God and of heaven. I would um, also let you all know that this is being um, shared virtually um, on the Kennensburg Facebook page and will be uploaded later to YouTube to be able to be shared with family who are unable to gather with us today, who would have been standing up and speaking um, on behalf of Donald and his life. And so we acknowledge those who are not able to be here, his, um, his cousin Luke, who grew up with him the same age and the same um, generation who would have been here to say some wonderful words about his life and I know is watching um, and sharing in this service. Um, I would like to invite um, Haley and Lily to come forward um, if they'd like to, to share the words that they have put together um, 
to honor their Uncle Donald. Hi, my name is Haley, and I am Molly's oldest daughter, Donald's niece. Okay. It has become that time again where we have to stock every room in the house with tissues and the altar, too. The air is filled with the weight of our shock and grief, tainted by the shadows of a lost love that has no place to go. There is never a right time to say goodbye to someone you love, never enough memories or laughs to cherish. People tend to think that grief shrinks over time, but in reality, we just learn to grow around it. It takes a while to come to terms with loss, what it means to live without the physical warmth of a loved one, and instead, learning to find comfort in the joy of their spirit. Today, I ask each of you to tread gently, not just around my family, but around each other, as our whole world goes through a time when we are all grieving something or someone special. My Uncle Donald had a hearty laugh, big and unapologetic, and it always managed to fill up a room. Traveling across the wide wooden dinner table where we eat family meals, echoing through St. John's Church during Christmas Eve services. The guy always wore shorts. Always. This past Christmas, when Grandpa had built a fire in the living room, Donald complained to me that it was 500 million degrees in there and insisted I open a window or a door or something for goodness sake. He wore torn socks had salt and pepper hair, which he said was from us kids, and had a big tiger tattooed around his calf area that always grabbed my attention as a toddler because, you know, it was at eye level. Um, Uncle Donald had an intense hug, one that grabbed you as soon as you walked into the room and tased you in the sides if you tried to wriggle away. He'd look at me and say, how did a person like your mom end up with a perfect kid like you? <laughs> he liked to spoil his grandson, Xavier. He brought fruit trays with that amazing pink dip to all our family gatherings. He explained insurance to me out on the patio when I was 13. <laughs> he loved to argue, especially with his brother, Trey. He adored his kittens, as you've heard, Snuggles and Yoda, whose names may confuse you if you have only seen Donald, but make perfect sense if you are a person who knew his soul. He cherished home-harvested honey from my cousin Christian. He was stubborn and kind, patient and ignorant, a great man wrapped up in the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't have a particular memory to share. Donald was just always there. A constant stream of love, a teddy bear of a guy who enjoyed telling stories about how he and his brothers and cousins used to get to tr into trouble back in high school. He admired my responsibility and made each of us feel special. He was by no means perfect, but I could not be prouder to call him my family, and I am honored to have been loved by him in return. Thank you. This is Lily. She's my little sister. She wrote something to read as well. These past two years, our family has grown so close. Although I'm only 11, I have learned that grief is a part of life. As somebody very wise once told me, Grief does not mean we will never be happy again. It means this is when we should remember all the good times we had with that loved one. But to me, my body is still in shock that my uncle has now left us.
When I try to think about that, I envision Uncle Donald being up there in a better place with his little brother Jason, his good cousin James, and my cousin Matthew. My favorite thing about Uncle Donald was the warmth of his big hugs and the joy of his smile always making my day. One of my favorite memories with him was playing the new game I got for Christmas with him called Harry Potter Clue. He read all the instructions and then explained them perfectly to me so that we could figure out what they meant together. Uncle Donald was always so good at board games and was very patient when I didn't understand something. One of the things I surprisingly am going to miss the most about him was his teasing. He always knew when it was the right time to tease me, like when I was mad or frustrated, and he was great at telling when he should stop. I am honored to know Uncle Donald as the many great things he was. An uncle, a brother, a dad, a son, a grandfather, and the amazing person that has touched everybody's lives who is here today and even more. My Uncle Donald has taught me how to be kind, respectful, and has helped me grow into the girl I am today. I'll continue to walk in his footsteps, remembering him like I always have. Fun, loving, caring, stubborn, brave, strong, confident, goofy, thoughtful, and the great uncle he has always been. Rest in peace, Uncle Donald. I love you. I can take it out. I'm Molly, and I'm Donald's sister, and. <laughs> I had the privilege of doing all of his pictures, getting them together in his board. And it's so interesting how God, you know, speaks to you and the memories come flooding back of our childhood together. When Jason died and mom and dad told me that I was getting a new baby brother, I was skeptical. <laughs> There are pictures in the back. The first two are when he came to the farm the first day. And I'm in the background. You can tell I'm kind of like, hmm, who is this little boy? And then there's a picture of all mom holding the three of us on her lap. And I'm sort of kind of smirking or sighing or doing my Molly face. But then I loved him. Living in the country, we didn't have a lot of playmates, but Mom made sure that we had, you know, the best childhood. Donald was a playmate. I played school with him. We had a big willow tree in the front yard that swooped down and made, like, rooms. The branches touched the ground. It was so fun to go out there and set up chairs and tables and Mom had printed ditto sheets and things to pass out, and Donald would always sit there so patiently waiting for my next assignment. <laughs> he did. He listened. He cooperated. You know, when Monica told that story of him not getting mad at us, he was big and he was strong, and he never raised a hand to me ever. I did to him, but he never did to me, and he would just stand there, and you could tell when he was almost getting to the point where he was about ready to burst, like his nostrils would just flare out. Mallory and I would know, okay, we got to step aside. And in our adult years, 
he always kept in touch with us. He always called me. And as I was raising kids, I always didn't have the patience to talk to him because his speech is sort of delayed and it takes him a long time to say things. And I would get here, you know, he'd call and I'd say, Kevin, it's Donald. And I'd get on the phone, hi, Donald, how are you? Yeah, okay, well, here's Kevin. (laughs) And Kevin was really patient. Thank you, honey. And we have always come to Mom and Dad's farm for Christmas every year. I don't think there's a Christmas I miss except the year that I had Haley out in California. And when Donald and Tina separated, he came back to the family home every Christmas. And you know, that's, that's really special because you don't really get to spend Christmas Eve and wake up Christmas morning with your brothers when they're adults. But Donald and Trey were there. And there's pictures back there of when we were babies on the stairs because Mom and Dad always had the rule that you couldn't come downstairs until everything was set up, everything was ready, and so we had to wait upstairs and I had to get our pictures on the stairs. And in that picture, Trey is screaming, and Donald's sitting there really pleasant. He's smiling. <laughs> and he's still, as adults, we have pictures of us on the stairs Christmas morning. The last picture I took of him was on Christmas morning this year. He was always up late at night with us, preparing for Christmas, helping us set things up, having conversation with us. Those are my treasured memories of him as an adult because they were intimate and they were... They were our intimate moments that I will always remember and thank him for. And I'm so glad that we were able to do that as adults. And when you look at those pictures, make sure you do in the back because you can see the love of his family and the love that he had for all of us to come to every single family gathering. He didn't miss one. And that's something for him to take the time to do that and to travel. He always came to Pittsburgh. Anytime there was a birthday party, Kylie's bat mitzvah. Thank you all for being here. Are there any others who would like to share? Okay. Uh, we're going to try to call in so she could talk. So we'll give this a shot. I guess I'm the IT person for our <laughs> families and our community and our neighborhood. So. Uh, so. If I can see to do this. Well, he just texted me. So. <laughs> Luke, are you watching this? Because you need to pick up. Donald would be 
be flaring his nostrils right now. We don't need that. They said he'd be flaring his nostrils right now. We don't need that. Yeah. Okay. I don't even need that. I'm Alex Rowland. Um, normally when I do this, I say I'm an alcoholic. But no, I don't feel like this is the right place for that. Um, so I want to tell a real quick story since we're all pretty sad. This might lift you. So on Sunday, um, the week before Donald passed, I went to the hospital. And as I was pulling in, you know, there was a guy, and he was all testy. And he was arguing with the ladies at the, you had to go in and check in. And uh, he was arguing with these women. And I'd say the guy's about this big, you know, he had a hat on. He looked like your typical country, I'm going to get this stuff handled kind of guy. And um, I was just like, yeah, I'm here to see Donald Muffet. And they told me. And I, so I, I follow this guy. He gets on the air, elevator before me. He goes up. And then they tell you, you got to put on, like, this hazmat suit. So I'm putting that all on. And I go in, and I'm sitting with Donald. And what do you do? You know, he, he's not going to talk to me. And um, I, I'm a Roland, so we like to talk. So I was good with that. And uh, I'm sitting there. And then all of a sudden, this, that guy, he comes out. And then the Donald's nurse was a very big guy. He was probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big dude. And I just remember kind of looking at him, and he's super, super considerate and, and helpful. Well, he goes darting out of the room, and, they're like, and I hear, we got to get security. And I'm like, ooh, this is exciting, right? Because this is not an exciting time sitting in that room. And... Um, I'm telling Don, and then I'm explaining to Donald, I'm like, dude, check it out. <laughs> I know he can hear me. Like, I know he can hear me. He's just not responding. And so this guy, he's probably in his, you know, 50s, which to me is not so old now. Now, when I lived here, that was really old. Um, and and I, I just, and I'm like, Donald, there's some chaos going on here. This is great. And because um, it kind of broke that sadness and that monotony. And then all of a sudden I hear, we got to get security. And I'm like, ooh, security. The security guards were like 70. And I'm like, and I'm telling Donald, I'm like, dude, I think you could take these security guards out right now as you sit. And, and like, you know, I didn't get like, I'd love to tell you that he squeezed my hand and it was all miraculous. But no, none of that happened. But like, that was my last memory of Donald was me sitting in there and us, you know, communicating this just chaos and, and hilarious story of this guy that's about 5'5", five, five, you know, and, and the guy's really sad, you know, he's, he's, his mom's dying, I'm guessing, and he's going off, and these security guards, and I'm like, all you would have to do is kind of blow on those guys and they'd fall over, what are they going to do, and, and, and it was just such a crazy scene in the midst of, of this. And, and, I, and that's what I get to remember, which is for me very, very good. Because there were many times on the, on the farm, I lived with them, and uh, you know, when they talk about family, you, you can't not talk about Janet and Mickey. And as much as the uh, catastrophes and chaos that I caused when I lived there, they took me in and, uh, and gave me a, a home. And, and I always felt like it was like Donald and I against everyone, especially Molly. It was always against Molly and her boyfriend. He had this blue car and she came home late every night and I'd always be like, man. And then I, I would get in trouble because I would be like four minutes late and you know, going anywhere was an hour and a half drive. And uh, I would be like three minutes late and Mickey would be like, well, you got to go in the library and read a book for a half hour. And I'm like, I'm not reading that book. And then Molly would come strutting in and I'd be like, oh, it's so terrible. And, uh, you know, and then Don, it, I always felt like it was, you know, he and I against all the siblings. And, uh, and, you know, as we got older, I would be at the lake house, and like, like Monica said, he would just pop up. Hey, what's up? Oh, hey. 
And you can't miss him. And we would just sit there and watch Law and Order because that's about all you get down here. And uh, we would just watch TV for hours and talk. And, you know, when he moved to New Philly, and th- it, 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 I always felt like, it, you know, and over the last few weeks I felt like, man, I had an opportunity to really, you know, be there for Donald and, and show him as, as, as a bigger brother and how much I failed there. You know, but if I look at that, like I, I gave him everything not to do. Do not do this, do not do that, do not do this, and you'll be okay. And, um, you know, I, I have to remember that I looked, I remember Donald always striving, no matter, you know, let's be fair here, Donald didn't have the, the gift of, uh, you know, slenderness. And he, he struggled with that his whole life, you know, and, and we, str- we struggled with a lot of similar things, you know, the the insecurities, the self-worth, the self-esteem, we struggled with that. And he and I talked about that a lot. And, and to know that no matter what, he kept going and kept going and kept going. And uh, to me, that's what I have to remember. I have to remember those 80-year-old or whatever old security guards that I thought, well, Donald, if you can take one breath and you can get out of that chair, you could take these dudes out. And what a story that'd be. You know, and, and, and that's what I think of when I think of Donald now. And, and for me, that's a beautiful remembrance not of him laying in that bed with tubes all through him but of us you know making this like miraculous movie scene of like pew, out of nowhere he hops up and we save the day from this you know whatever he was angry dude in, in the uh, ICU you know and that that was that's how I want to remember Donald so has he called yet well you can talk all right thank you read a poem here, but, um, you know, Donald and I didn't <laughs> agree on, well, much of anything, but, uh, but he did have the biggest heart, and uh, I got to see him when he went into the ER, and I talked to him, and he had a chew in, he had a oxygen, and he had a chew in, and I said, Donald, should you be doing that? And he scoffed at me, spit in his cup. And uh, when I picked up his belongings, they had a sheet that had confiscated materials. (laughs) And it said, one can blue skull. And I picked up his bag, and he had four more in there. So (laughs) they didn't get all of them. But, uh, you know, a testament to how you know, how loving he was and how much he cared. The last thing he said to me when I was walking out was, tell Katie I'm sorry if she gets sick. (sighs) She didn't get sick, but he was still concerned. Okay. When I die, give what's left of me away to children and other men that wait to die. If you need to cry, cry for your brother walking the street beside you. And when you need me, put my arms around everyone and give them what you need to give to me. I want to leave you something, something better than sounds or words. Look for me in the people I've known or loved And if you cannot give me away, at least let me live on in your eyes and not on your mind. You can love me the most by letting hands touch hands and by letting bodies touch bodies and by letting go of children that need to be free. Love does not die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. I'll see you at home, in the heavens and in the earth. <laughs> Luke, are you there? Hey, cousin Trey. Hey, cousin Luke. I'm going to try to hold you up to this speaker here. So. Okay. All right. 
Okay, buddy. Hey, this is Luke Ryer calling in from Dayton, Ohio, and I just wanted to say a few words about my good cousin Donald, if I can get them out. Most of my best, <clears throat> so most of my best childhood memories involve Donald. Um, he and I spent so much time together as kids down at uh, Aunt Janet and Uncle Mick's place, and it was just the ideal environment for a couple of little boys to be boys. We had everything. We had our health, we had good parents, and we didn't have a care in the world, and we had a blast. And I just want to sum it up. I just want to sum it up by saying that Donald, um, he wasn't just my first cousin, but he was my first best friend. And I want to thank him for it. And I want to thank Aunt Janet and Uncle Mick for giving him to us. And that's all I want to say. Thank you and God bless. We love you, Luke. You know, I wanted to tell a quick story about Luke and Donald. They, they played in that pond and they got into a lot of mischief. But uh, I just remember this one time Donald was in the pond and he kept ducking down into the water and Luke was throwing rocks at him. <laughs> and he'd pop up and Luke would chuck a rock. And uh, I don't know where he found it, but Luke found a piece of slate. I don't think he knew what it was at the time, but as soon as Donald comes up, that slate comes flying it hits Donald in the head, slid his head all the way back, and, and Donald's bleeding everywhere, and Luke threw up. <laughs> <laughs> and Donald said, what are you doing, Luke? He said, you need to get out of there. You need to get stitches. And Donald said, what are you talking about? <laughs> are there any others who would like to share and help us grieve and laugh and love? You could stand there and I'll bring you a microphone or you could come up. <clears throat> On the back of Donald's card here, we have, a <clears throat> I'm, I'm Mallory. I, and I am convinced that, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the birth earth below indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of god that is revealed in christ jesus our lord romans 8 38 and 39 and we we know that um our family has experienced a period of great grief and we know that in times of grief it is um, the characteristic of some people, which is understandable, you can turn away from your faith or you can turn towards it. In our family, the elders before us, our loved ones have shown us that those who turn towards their faith fare better than those who turn away from it. And we know that through all the trials we've had through our troubles or for, or for grief, that there are tremendous blessings for all of us. And given the circumstances, we know I'd like to say to our friends and our family who are here and those who are watching, I know some have had the doubts to say, why does God save some and not others? Well, we don't know. Maybe the trials from recovery are just going to be too great. 
or maybe it's just God's plan for the time. But though the, those of us who choose to follow, follow our faith and turn towards it, we will find ourselves in a better position. <clears throat> I tell my children, um, for me and my household, we choose to serve the Lord. And it is an obvious choice because God is all around us all the time, even though we can't see it like air. We have the opportunity to turn our decisions and our lives towards him, to look for the blessings and the guidance that he has to offer us, to lead the good life that he wants us to lead here on earth. We have the opportunity to make our choices, to, to um, confess our regrets, to let them go, and to lead the new lives he has for us from now on. I wanted to say that we, uh, we had so many blessings in our trials of grief, and one for Donald is that we were all able to be with him. We could go to the hospital, we could visit one person, at, one person at a time, but a different person each day, which is a new visitation policy, so nice. So we could go, we gave opportunity for those of us who were there to be the ambassadors for those of us who weren't. You could call in, we could hold the phone to Donald. I am sure that he heard us. We were able to offer him, all, read to him all of the text messages, all the prayers, all the concerns, names I hadn't heard for years. I laughed and I cried, and, if, and many of you know it took me over three hours on Monday to read to him the messages from our loved ones everyone in Louisville and everywhere else that was praying for him or had asked about him, I know he heard me. And there, on Wednesday when his doctor said to us, we were on a conference call that his lungs were too bad and it was time to let him go. They gave us opportunity to make sure we all had time to go see him. And Uncle Daniel came Aunt Julie and Annie, so he was, the Rollins came. We, we had the blessing of not only hearing from all his friends and extended family, the biological sisters, God love them, they, everybody called in. Donald was fussed over by six sisters. Who knew? God love him. He had that many. Um, but we, we could, and um, to picture the scene, we were in his room. We could lay our hands on him. Annie led us in hymns, and um, we, were, we sang three hymns, said a prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and uh, Donald was gone. By our faith, I know for sure God scooped him up and took him straight home immediately. We know for sure that he is loved tremendously beyond belief. And I, for those of you who are here and those who are listening, I encourage you, if you've dropped your faith, pick it up. Amen. I'm Kylie, I'm Molly's middle daughter, and I have so many memories of my uncle that it's hard to just pick one. But one that sticks out is before Christmas we were all coming and we just had a family dinner and we were talking about socks for the, I don't even know why, but we were talking about socks and he was like, wouldn't it be so cool if socks were like heated? Like, wouldn't it, you could just plug it in and you could heat the socks. And I'm like, yeah, that would be amazing. And then Christmas came around, and we were talking, and he's like, Kylie, guess what? It's like, what? It's like, I found socks. And he's like, I ordered them on Amazon, but I didn't know what size you wanted. And I was like, oh. I was like, that is, that just warms my heart. And then he always put up with me. He was the only one that got all my jokes, and we would be sitting at the table, and I'm a teenager, so I have some weird jokes that, like, 
I make and we were sitting around and I say something and everyone's like, what, what is she talking about? Like, I don't get that. And, and I look at him and he's like, he's like, oh, I got that one. I got that, like, that was funny, that was funny. And he, his humor was always like, he just got everything. He was open to everything. He let me paint his nails all the time, like green and blue. And he would always pose with them like this. And I have a bunch of pictures of him and he would always, that and I'm, I'm really happy that I had all those memories with him. And no matter like what he would always remember, he was always there and he always brought dip and he was always, he could do anything and everyone would just smile. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> there was a young girl speaking at church not very long ago, and um, I said I could give her some pointers on how to give a speech because I taught speech for so many years and one was don't read that from your phone. She kept trying to, find, well now I have my phone, I'm going to read it. So um, I wanted to say a couple things about Luke. You know, he and Donald were just great buddies and they were together real, literally all the time. On, in the summer, we would all get our chores done in the morning, Julie's family and our family, and she had four kids, we had four kids, and then at lunchtime, Everybody would come to the park and go swimming. And uh, Mick said, everybody has to be out by 4 o'clock because I want to come home to not a bunch of kids. And uh, so we would take advantage of that. And one day, Julie and I were in the house, and Donald and Luke came in. They were covered in blood. Their faces, their fingers, their, what did you do? What did you do? Well, we had a chest freezer in the garage. They got into the frozen strawberry jam. They dug in it. And then we have to tell this. I know some people are a little bit squeamish, but um, Luke told these stories, and I thought that was going to be in his speech today. But he and Donald were so orny, they got into peeing. They peed in Mickey's boots. They peed in Molly's Barbie doll jacuzzi. They peed in the shampoo bottle. And at that time, we had one bathroom that you could take a bath in, and uh, just a half bath upstairs. And I get in the shower, and I pick up that shampoo bottle, and it felt kind of like a loose liquid in there. And I went, and the screams you could have heard, who peed in the shampoo bottle? Now tell me why boys do that. <laughs> because it can, yeah. Well, here's... Here's what really impressed me about um, what's happened in the last week or so is that um, we put on Facebook that if anybody had a, a memory that they wanted to share with Donald, his birthday was coming up, and if they would put that on Facebook, then that got shared and shared and shared, and Mallory put things on. And we've got so many responses that Mick read them all day on Sunday last week, and he would read some, and then he'd yell at Donald about that, and then he'd read some and yell at Donald about And his heart rate went up to 224 when Mick was there yelling. The nurses had to rush in and fix that. And then <laughs> Mallory reads for three hours on Monday to him all the messages. There were so many. And is Kristen here, Joe? She's not here. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Kristen sent this because she said, okay. She texted this to Mallory because she wanted it put on Donald's messages. Hi, Mallory. I don't have Facebook, so I thought I would text you my story. Donald and I are very close to the same age, so we always hung out together. I'd come to the farm, and you would let me ride Bridget, which was my favorite horse, because she was so gentle. We would go for horse rides. We would swim in the pond and sink the canoe we would do that all the time and then swim under the canoe with the big air pockets and hang out and think that was so fun. You were my prom date because no one would take me. He drove up there in, to Barberton in that Camaro and took Kristen the most beautiful prom date in the world. No, I can't find my place because it's the phone, not my papers. Let me see. 
You were there when I needed a friend. I know over time we grew up and had our own families, and I'm glad that I've had the chance to spend time with you since you moved to New Philadelphia and closer to me. They had dinners together. I didn't know what God's plan for you is, but I know that I love you and my family loves you and always will. Love, Kristen. And I'll try to get the next one. <clears throat> this impressed me too because, um, you know, we've been talking about you never know when you say something to someone how that is going to affect you. And Barb Moore told Mick, at, we were at a little meeting not long ago, and she said something that he had said to her a hundred years ago stayed with her and made her feel so good and you know, we said, you just don't know those little things that are going to um, change somebody's life. <clears throat> well, you know, we have an equine-assisted therapy program, Gifted Gates, and we do on the farm. And so we deal with a lot of people who um, have disabilities and a lot of parents who suffer with those kids who have disabilities. And um, we find ourselves being the ones that they can talk to. And we know that horses have a great... Um, propensity for healing, and we believe that God created them to do that, to be vessels of healing. And um, I want to share this with you. This is from a, a young woman now. Her name is was Stacy Seacrest, not Stacy Seacrest, tell me, Wendy Seacrest. And her, I don't know what her married name is, but she has brought her 4-H clubs or her Girl Scouts out to the farm to um, witness uh, and volunteer. And she says this, sending you all lots of love and prayers. I have so many wonderful memories of Donald to share. They grew up together in grade school, and she was in that musical down by the creek bank that we saw on the video for a while. Donald was about eight, and so was she, and they you know, shared that together with our, our group. And she said, but my favorite has to be our group horseback rides in high school. We rode for hours. We all talked about everything, laughed, decompressed, saw the beautiful sights on your property and the surrounding area that you don't see by car. They were some of the best memories of my teen years. And for those of you who know, Wendy, her dad was killed in an automobile crash when she was little. And she suffered a lot from that. And she said, they were complete calm, therapeutic in so many ways, mind freeing time. I needed those days back then more than anyone knew. I truly believe they helped me keep my sanity. So you just never know. Then, I have this to say, I'll find it on my phone, new note. Okay, I wanted to share this with Annie so many times after Matthew died. And, you know, we think Luke or Eli had a talk with me the other night, and he said, you know, it's, death is funny, isn't it, Nana? And he said, I think about Matthew all the time. I think about him every day. And I said, well, I, th I think that's because when people are with us and they're alive and they're there, you know they're there. They're going to be there when you get home for dinner and they're going to be there when you go to their party. But when they're not there in human form, they're there. They're with you all the time. And I have a young mother who comes to the Ipta Gates and she has two children who are terminally ill. And you know, she's shared so much with us, the staff, and with me about the things that she's going through. And after Matthew died, Annie, she sent me this. And she thought it would help comfort me because I was grieving for you. And she knows she's going to have the same grief. It's, it's like almost unbelievable. But here it goes. She shared this story from a friend. The friend says, I lost a child, and here's what you need to know. <clears throat> she
she was telling this to a friend. I was talking with a friend who came to me after losing her only child. She was telling me all the things she thinks people need to know about her loss. I'll never be an expert on the subject of child loss. I've had many losses, but I've never had a child, so I never fully understood the pain of losing one. So I'll tell you what my friend thinks people need to know, including myself. I'll share with you what she taught me. If you've lost a child, then you'll most likely know and understand the pain, a degree of suffering that's impossible to grasp without experience it firsthand. Often when we know someone else is experiencing grief, our discomfort keeps us from approaching it head on. But they want the world to remember their child or children, no matter how young or how old the child was. My friend said, if you see something that reminds you of my child, tell me. If you're reminded at the holidays or on his birthday that I'm missing my son, please tell me. You remember him. And when I speak his name or relive memories, relive them with me. Don't shrink away. If you never met my son, don't be afraid to ask about him. One of my greatest joys is talking about him. She also said she wishes people would stop trying to fix her, what I call an out-of-order death, such as child loss, breaks a person, especially a parent, in a way that's not fixable or solvable. They'll learn to pick up the pieces and move forward, but their lives will never be the same. Every grieving parent finds a way to convince to continue to live with loss, and it's a solitary journey. They appreciate our support, but we have to be patient with them as they try to find their way. Next page. Never tell a grieving parent it's time to get back to life, that it's been long enough, or that time heals all wounds. They need support and love, and although sometimes it's hard to watch them suffer, their brokenness isn't going to go away. It's something to observe, recognize, and accept. My friend told me that there are at least two days a year she needs a time out. She still counts birthdays and fantasizes about what her child would be like if he were still living. Birthdays are especially hard. Her heart aches to celebrate her child's arrival into the world, but she is left becoming intensely aware of the hole in her heart instead. Then there's the anniversary of the date of her child becoming an angel. This is a remarkable process similar to a parent of a newborn first counting the days, then the months, then the one-year anniversary, marking the one time on the, so on the other side of that hole in her heart. No matter how many years go by, the anniversary date of when her child died brings back deeply emotional memories and painful feelings. Here's the thing. Parents who have lost a child struggle every single day with happiness. Just like anyone else that's grieving, it's an ongoing battle to balance the pain and guilt of outliving your child with the desire to live in a way that honors them and their time on the earth. As bereft parents, they are constantly balancing holding grief in one hand and a happy life after loss in the other. It's a loss that is unnatural, out of order, and it challenges our sense of safety. My friend said, everyone needs to know that a parent will never forget their child 
and in fact, their loss is always right under the surface of other emotions, even happiness. She said, I would rather lose I would rather lose it because you spoke his name and remembered my child than try and shield me from the pain and live in denial. I am grateful my friend shared her feelings with me, and I agree. It was all information I need to know. We all need to know. And the last family witness that we'll hear from is his godfather, Daniel. Daniel Muffet, and I was fortunate and blessed to be asked to be God, Donald's godfather. And I take that role of being a godfather very personally. You not only have the opportunity to witness to someone spiritually, but also lovingly, kindly, and compassionately. You all heard Donald came to the farm when he was two and a half years old. I was working in, at the farm, and I was helping Mick with all his apartments in, in Barnesville. And I was also preparing myself for playing football at Mount Union. This was the summer of my jun before my junior year, and I had a lot of time after work to spend with all the kids. Mallory, who to this day thinks I'm her brother. <laughs> Molly, Trey, and of course Donald. Donald was always around. He always seemed to be connected with me very quickly. I would put him on my back and do push-ups. I'd lift weights, and he'd watch me try to imitate me lifting weights and, and try to do whatever I was doing. He loved to fish. And I would practice my football steps with him and put him on defense. And he had, like you all heard, this deep, infectious, deep laugh for somebody so little. And Donald loved watching The Incredible Hulk, if you all remember that. And we'd watch it together. And he'd get very excited whenever the Hulk would turn green. He'd always jump on me, and I'd, I'd act like he was working me over and, uh, when he turned into the Hulk. And it got so bad that Mick and Janet had to finally ban him from watching the Hulk because he started ripping all his shirts off. His brand new shirts, he started, he started ripping them off. Um, after I graduated from Mountain Union, I had the opportunity to come back. I was living in a mixed apartment, and uh, I was teaching seventh and eighth grade in Sarasville and uh, coaching football. And I have to tell you, I was renting a mixed apartment and he had all the keys, of course. And when I'd come back in, I'd notice my bed looked a little different. I'd open the refrigerator, and I'd think, I thought Mom gave me more food than this. So it was a pretty good spot for Mick to come in and take his big naps and uh, rest up. But at times, he'd bring, me to Bar bring Donald to Barnesville to spend the night with me. And there was a Dairy Queen there in Barnesville. I'd always take down the Dairy Queen, and then we'd watch a football game or go to a wrestling match, and he'd spend the night. And when I coached, Donald would always come on the field with me. 
Everybody knew him. I'd always include him at the end of the games. And uh, he just thought that was such a big deal back then. And like you heard, I happily helped Donald get several jobs. Trucking jobs, all state agencies. And I was uh, the all state regional sales manager back then. And I had a number of good friends, and a couple of them are right here, Scott Cranus and, and Mike Taylor that came. And Donald was highly intelligent. I mean, it was really amazing. He passed these insurance tests. Every single one of them he'd pass on the first try. That's real, real hard to do, isn't it, Scott? And he was the happiest and most successful um, working at the Mike Taylor Agency in New Philadelphia. Mike had one of the biggest agencies, right, Scott, in the whole country. And Donald enjoyed his job. Everybody at the office worked well together, and they all liked Donald. He'd set appointments, and I have two to verify this. He was probably the best appointment setter in my whole territory, North and Southeast Ohio. He just had this uncanny ability to just talk on the phone and, and set appointments. Um, it worked out well for me because I got to spend time with Donald and um, uh, go out on appointments with him and help him enroll the cases. And Mike was a big supporter of, of Donald uh, because he was a veteran. But he was, he was very happy back then. And he would always leave me these messages. And they were long, long, long messages. And they would go something like this. Uncle Dan, this is Donald. Thank you. I left you a message. Will you call me back when you get a minute? I love you, Uncle Dan. And tell Aunt Patty, I love her also. And I'd like my friend Scott Cranus and Mike Taylor to stand up and uh, give them applause. <laughs> Donald, Donald made more money there than he ever made. He developed such good friendships with so many people. And of all my years of being in insurance, I never remember uh, an office like Mike's. The camaraderie, the relationships, it was just an ideal setting for, for him. And um, I was just real happy that I had a, had a part of that with him. And you all know, and Mallory did a good job up there with the faith, but you know in the Bible, the first commandment is you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like unto it. You love your neighbor as yourself. And one time I was with Donald. We were at Bob Evans eating lunch. And all of a sudden, a veteran passed by. And Donald stood up straight stood straight up, looked him in the eye, and he said, I want to thank you for your service. And I was so taken back by that because I just never saw anybody do that before. And when Donald sat down, I said, Donald, that was really nice of you to do that. I was really impressed. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, Uncle Dan, he's a veteran. Um, we all know that Donald was in service. And one time I was running, and then Donald was talking and talking to me. And he said, Uncle Dan, I ran 10 miles in service with my boots on. And I said, I don't know about that, Don. <laughs> he said, oh, I did, Uncle Dan, I did. So like a goofball, I said, okay. If you ran 10, now I'm 62 years old. I said, I'm going to run 11. Um, 
So I did run 11. Ask Scott Cranus. <laughs> April 22nd, 2021. <laughs> but with all of Donald's kindness, as we all know, he was set in his ways. And he tended to be a little stubborn. And I tried and tried and tried and tried to get down to lose weight and take better care of himself. My brother Mick here even offered him $100 per pound. And I'd always tell Mick, I don't think that's very fair. I said, when I was little one in the fourth grade playing for the Oakdale Red Devils, I was so heavy I couldn't raise my legs over my head. And the coach kept saying, we're going to keep doing this till Danny Muffet. I said, well, I couldn't do it. So I came home very depressed, and Mick and his good friend Steve Postage were home for the summer. So here is my pep talk from Mick. No, nothing. He says, you're a fat boy. That's the story. You're a fat boy. I got promoted to a fat man, but I, he said, you're a fat boy. He said, you got to start working out. And I didn't want to listen because it was kind of fun being fat. I wore husky pants, but my mom took the labels off and hit them and said, my brother Joe over here, my skinny brother Joe, they were his, but I, I think they were mine. But um, he built me a wooden bench, pulled out the weights, and Bill, my cousin Billy, we were doing three sets of eight, and when the third set of eight was easy, went up five pounds, right, Mick? And he said, you better start running, too. And at the end of the week, I always had to mail this to Mick and to Mount Union. And he'd bring it home, he'd pull out the sheet, and he'd say, okay, you said you could do this weight, let me see you do it. So that was a big turning point with me, but you see the difference. 100 pounds and a fat boy. Um, so, <laughs> and like I was saying, Donald tended to be stubborn, as kind hearted as he was. And we'd like to all think if he would have kept himself in better shape, controlled his weight, taking the necessary shots, taking the medicine like he was supposed to, he still might have been with us today. So I want you to think about these things, six things to take away from Donald's passing. The first thing, we need to take good care of ourselves, physically, mentally, and like Mallory said, spiritually. Physically, mentally, spiritually. We need to listen to what others say who love and care about you and the advice they give you. You need to say your prayers and look how quick Donald went. So each day, you need to count your blessings and you need to thank God daily for the life that we still have on this earth. Number five, do not be afraid to show your emotions and to cry, especially if you're a man. My 84-year-old friend, Perry Range, told me that if you can cry and show your emotions, that's God's way of healing. And I know I was real close to Donald, but... I've been crying every day. It's the craziest thing. Sometimes two or three times a day since Donald was admitted to the hospital. And uh, I think I'm getting better. And then just out of the blue, I start thinking about him and start crying again. And like Janet said, you know, at least they're more silent now, but... Don't be afraid to show your emotions. And my one niece told me that um, we also need to learn to tell people how much we care about them and how much they mean to us and how much they love us. 
my niece and god godchild Nikki uh, sent me that, and it was really neat because she sent it to me, and um, she was in the wet. She was the flower girl in the wedding, and Molly, and those two cried and cried their heads off when Patty and I got married, down in this nice white tuxedo and all that. But Nikki said, you know, I want you to know, Uncle Dan, that I love you, and you're a good man. So we have to let people know how much you love and care about them. You know, small acts of kindness are remembered for a lifetime. And my neighbor, Bonnie, the one that has the dog that loves me, she sent me this card, and in closing, the words on the front said, those we hold in our hearts never truly leave us. Those we hold in our hearts never truly leave us. So I want you to repeat this. God bless Donald. God bless Donald, I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank all my friends that came, Scott, Mike, and may God bless all of you. There is a song in our United Methodist hymnal titled, I Sing a Song for the Saints of God. And some of the lyrics go like this. They loved their Lord so dear, so dear, and his love made them strong. And they followed the right for Jesus' sake and the whole of their good lives long. They lived not only in ages past, there are hundreds of thousands still. The world is bright with the joyous saints who love to do Jesus' will. You can meet them in school, on the street, in the store, in church, by the sea, in the house next door. They are saints of God, whether rich or poor, and I mean to be one too. Donald was one of those saints. And as you've heard today, honor his life by being one too. Be a saint. Be a gift to the world. Leaving it better than you found it. Be a ripple. God bless Donald. God blessed us with Donald. Donald lived his life of faith, a life of living in the promise of eternal life that we have heard, witnessed to, and testified today. Another scripture that speaks to me about Donald's life is that Jesus will reply, well done, good and faithful servant. Donald's family is filled with builders of homes. But hear these words about the house where Donald is now. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In the scripture it says, in my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I, Jesus, go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself. And so that where I am, there you may also be. And knowing the way to the place where I am going, I will not leave you orphaned again. I am coming to you. And in a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. 
Because I live, you will also live. I have said these things to you while I'm still with you, Jesus said, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Let us pray. God of us all, your love never ends. And when all else seems to fail, you are still God. We pray to you, God, for one another in our need and for all everywhere who mourn with us this day. To those who doubt, give light. To those who are weak, strength. To all who have sinned, mercy. And to all who sorrow, your peace. Keep true in us the love with which we hold one another. In all of our ways, we trust in you. Eternal God, you have shared with us the life of Donald. Before he was ours, he was yours. And for all that Donald has given us to make us what we are, for that of him which lives and grows in each of us, and for his life that your love will never end, we give you thanks. And as now, we offer Donald back into your arms. Comfort us in our loneliness. Strengthen us in our weakness. Give us courage to face the future unafraid. And draw those of us who remain in this life closer to one another. Make us faithful to serve one another. And give us to know that peace and joy which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord.